Hi, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, it's just great to be around people again. And uh, as a designer, um, and someone who's sort of dedicated his life to the idea of gathering, uh, it's, it's just wonderful to be here tonight. Uh, it's great to see family, friends, peers, um, and, and a lot of uh, professionals I've worked with over the years. And it's also great to be back in Dallas. It's great to be back in Dallas working as an architect, um, doing designs, um, and trying to uh, take you know, our little sites and, and, and catalyze something maybe that could be, be larger. Um, you know, my first job, my first true job coming out of architecture school at UT was, um, was for an office here in Dallas. And uh, so it's, it's nice and we'd have staff here and we hope to have an office here soon. Um, just a little synopsis of sort of the background. People ask a lot of times when you're in Texas, where, where are you from? And uh, I, was, I was born in Taiwan, moved here as, at the age of three. I uh, grew up in Pasadena, Texas, um, stayed away from Gillies, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but enjoyed that. Um, University of Texas, working in the Netherlands, and then I worked for 10 years under Dick Clark, a well-known architect in Austin, Texas, who, who was, uh, who was uh, uh, from a Dallas family and uh, did his, uh, did his um, graduate work at the GSD, and I learned a lot from Dick. Um, our office is in all three of the major Texas cities right now. Dallas, Austin, and Houston, which these slides clearly <laughs> communicate. It's, it's casual Friday in Austin in that middle slide. And I know Neiman Marcus is, is what everyone uh, knows Dallas for. Um, but we, we enjoy the tropes of the state, and we feel like um, the richness that Texas offers that I've gotten to experience is really something that informs everything that, that we do. Our firm truly believes that the sort of fold and richness that design and architecture can bring to uh, sort of people's lives um, really has to be fed by really looking at our lives and our context uh, fully in the face and embracing and, and bringing all of those things to bear uh, in our practices. So tonight, the work I'm going to show you is really the result of many, many, many people, a lot of consultants and uh, team members and business partners of mine that are in the room tonight. Um, the firm has two principals, myself and Maya Kreischmann, and we have six other partners who are full owners in the firm as well. Um, we right now have about 93 members in Texas and in other cities in the United States. Um, and people ask us all the time, like, how do you do design and scale uh, at the same time? And it, it is really difficult. I mean, it is not, it is not easy. Um, but the only way to do that is through sort of building leadership and working with people that you believe in and vice versa. Um, and um, that sort of collaboration is very close and it's the only way our office operates. Um, we are a fully integrated architecture and interior design studio. We have branding staff in our uh, in, in office. We're looking to sort of um, expand design and work in landscaping and urbanism, not because we want to be those offices or supplant those sort of professionals we work with, because we want to bring that knowledge to every scale of project that we work on. Um, so it's become really important for office to try and serve people. We have, we have a set of values that we talk about very explicitly in our office. Um, one of the first questions is, who do, who do we serve? And we want to serve a lot of different uh, groups of people, a lot of audiences. So these are some recent projects. At the lower left hand corner is Habitat for Humanity's first uh, multifamily project in Central Texas, transitioning away from single family housing because we know how difficult and, and expensive housing has become, especially single family housing. And our firm works on uh, governmental agencies to help try and push sort of changes in land use and code to, to allow for more housing. Uh, the middle image is a Tiny Victories project in Austin where we have a, um, we have a, a homeless crisis there and there are some organizations working with architects to build tiny, tiny homes to, uh, to house these sort of underserved communities. 
And then the slide to the right is, is an in-office effort that we are taking on to sort of um, seek and uh, work with great nonprofits to s help them seed and envision what their future could be as it relates to facilities. Um, so that's an ongoing effort that our office hopes to expand in the future. The first project I wanted to talk about is the terminal at Katy Trail because it truly starts to encapsulate cohesively what the office is about, an integrated architecture and interior design approach, um, and one that talks about very private space, but also tries to investigate what a public realm can look like in a commercial development, uh, which, because of the building's location, it had to do. This is a project to where the ownership group, we felt like was so lined up um, Capital Peak Ventures, who's here tonight, Blake and Lindsay Ship, along with Lori Sands Harrison, are our clients on this project. Um, we are, it's coming out of the ground. Um, you see it right off of Fitzhugh, right there. Here's the Katy Trail running north south, and it's on the northeast corner. It's a steel, it's a concrete frame that's going up right now. It's at the sort of lower end of the um, Knox Henderson sort of a district that's that's getting a lot of attention right now. So the ownership and the team were were really incredibly enthusiastic about this site, um, but in order for it to really feel connected to a larger community, a community outside of the bounds of the building itself, we had to make sure that it it sort of spoke to a larger community. Um, so, the center of the building is given away to a public space. We talk a lot about public realm. We talk a lot about the experience of design as opposed to the appearance of design or the appearance of buildings or formal design. We talk a lot about programming and activation and how we can speak to people at a neurological and emotional level. Um, and that means bringing people in through buildings and sort of blurring those boundaries between what is public and what is private space, especially on a civic amenity and, and a, a place like the Katy Trail at the top here. Uh, the whole building shifted to the left of screen in order to build a new connector, which will take users from Buena Vista all the way to the Katy Trail. I think entrance points to the trail can be challenging in many of the points. So this will be an ongoing uh, new park that is uh, being built out by the clients and will be um, will be dedicated um, to the Byatt and to the Hunt family um, in the future. Just to give a quick sort of overview, there'll be a little bit of alley in front. The residents, there's, we started with 19 um, condo units in this project. This level that you're seeing here is dedicated to retail, food and beverage specifically. And then residents go underneath the building and then there's parking also um, off of Fitzhugh, and the developers were really keen to say if we if we if we use the usual ground plane to sort of build for the automobile, we're going to lose all the opportunity of this site. So they made the early decision to spend the extra money to put cars underground. So you can see that entrance right here and right here. Uh, this is Fitzhugh, Buena Vista, running to the north, and the Katy Trail, the uh, the old trestle right there. Um, the clients were really inspired by their travels, in particular the sort of historic masonry buildings that they saw in, in old train stations in sort of a pre-vehicular cities. Um, so that's really what we started with, sort of exploring the grandeur of these large spaces that felt like communal spaces. But then at the same time, trying to put a building on top and appeal to an audience that was probably transitioning from a different type of single family home environment into something that was going to be a, a you know communal space. And how do we do that and make sure that we're, we're sort of speaking to this audience in Dallas uh, in a right way. Um, you can see these condo units above, there's lots of interior exterior spaces. There was, a, this was designed a few years ago, but there was a deliberate sort of design approach to biophilic design 
um, incorporating natural materials and connecting it to the outdoor spaces as much as we can. We built in as much permeability into the building as we could. Um, this is on Buena Vista. You can see the residence entrance here, the public entrance back to the trail. And then there will be retail office spaces above and then food and beverage on the lower level connected back to the Katy Trail. This is a view from the Katy Trail. Um, the trestle is right down there. And you can see the sort of power pole that we, is on the corner there. And then we're working on the restaurant on this lower level here by a local restaurant group. This is on Buena Vista, and this is a bicycle path connecting straight to the trail and the pocket park here um, that will be built out by the, the Hunt family soon. Parking extends underneath this entire sort of plane underneath the, the project. And a view of the park. We wanted to really test the scale of this building. This is a substantially sized building for the area. It's about 100,000 square feet. A lot of the questions we're asking ourselves, like when a building gets to be 100,000 square feet, how can we ensure that it feels small, cozy, and it has like an individualized point of view? So, you know, the material selection, the sort of detailing, and the massing even really played into those ideas. Um, our firm does a, a tremendous amount of interior design. The interior design team designed this. Um, this is the residence concierge area with a lot of custom finishes and uh, light fixtures. We, we work with a tremendous number of vendors and builders and makers who execute these things uh, with our office. And, and a few images of what the interiors of the condos might look like when they're built out. We are currently working on the top level unit, um, which will be completely custom. These are, these are going to be very, very nicely appointed units. But uh, in the spirit of Dallas, there's always room for an upgrade. So um, <laughs> the, the upstairs unit, I think, will be um, is, is quite a special project. And we're looking forward to that. A lot of effort was trying, we were trying to sort of question what condo living might look like. We felt like we, you know, our inspiration points were really from single family traditional homes in material and scale um, and in execution. And these are, these are all renderings that the office produced as well. Um, so that's, that's been a, a great project for us, and we have staff dedicated in Dallas working on that, um, that job, and uh, we, we, uh, we expect it'll be, you know, we'll start moving folks in um, next year. The, the roots, my roots, are really in hospitality, restaurant design, and single family design. This was a house we completed a few years ago on the Llano River for an Austin client. Um, the story of their family was really, they, they had three girls and they camped out on this side on the Llano River in tents and in sleeping bags looking at the stars. And they wanted to ensure that even though their, their family was growing and they were more mature and had the ability to build something permanent for their family, they didn't want to lose that sense of attachment to the, uh, to the site. And the ability to, to be in their in the house itself and still feel like they're immersed in the stars. Um, our strategy was to create a very sort of glassy structure that was public space. The upstairs are where the kids exist with all of their friends. It's like a giant just bunkhouse upstairs. It opens up to the lake. The back courtyard area is where the landscaping gets to be a little bit more manicured. Um, they were very clear that scorpions and rattlesnakes were not okay in this area, but outside of that line, nature was going to take over, and, and, and that was part of embracing uh, being out in, in Mason, Texas. Um, and then a garage. And then you can see that the double master, double primary uh, bedrooms here was, were built as something a little bit more fortress-like. So it's a tripartite scheme. Um, privacy is about heavy masonry structures. 
the glassy structures, the common space. We built objects inside of it that were for the kids and the family to sort of exist inside of it. Um, and then the ability to turn off all the lights and just feel like you're still immersed in the stars when, um, when they're out here. You can see the Lano uh, just right there. But we love investigating sort of masses within masses. I think uh, part of that is, is a leftover from my education when UT was trying to uh, sort of transition from late postmodernism to decon, um, de deconstructivist architecture. And uh, it, was a, it was a really uh, fun time um, at UT and, and it, was, it was nice to have a foot in both of those sort of uh, um, design modes. This was an engineered wood building that uh, and simple concrete frame meant to really have low levels of maintenance, easy connections to outdoor spaces. And then um, the spirit of the finishes were to sort of leave them as, as unprocessed as we could. So the cabinets were just blued steel with white oak behind it, concrete floors, soapstone countertops, just with a wax finish on it. and more details of what that backyard might be, looking at it through a fireplace where the family gathers at night. Uh, the next house is a house we completed about a year and a half ago in, in Austin. And um, this was a house where we, we moved a few trees to allow the house to exist. And, and Austin, trees are, uh, anything over 19 inches is very, very hard to, to touch, to take down. So if you want to keep those trees and build your house, you have to you know, hire a tree moving company and take them and plant them elsewhere on your site. Um, so that's where we had the ability to tuck these trees very, very close to the building. This is a Columba brick, which is an incredibly beautiful product that we brought in for this house. Steel fascias. This is a residential street. The owners were fantastic and they really wanted glazing to be on the street. Their concern was that a house of this scale in the neighborhood would feel disconnected from its community. Um, so they were happy to sort of be cooking. This is the kitchen right here, to be cooking every night and have neighbors walk by and, and they wave at them. Um, but they also, wanted, <laughs> they also wanted privacy, so there is a courtyard in back. And I think this is something that uh, we really enjoy. It's just like meeting people at different sort of emotional spaces in their lives. Sometimes you want to be an extrovert, sometimes you do not. You want to be introverted. Um, and then homes and even office spaces uh, and workspaces should provide for those experiences. Um, this house has great green features, even though it doesn't maybe look like a, a quote-unquote um, intensive green project. There's photovoltaics, water collection. Um, we use VRF systems, which we do quite a bit on all of our jobs, so we can zone spaces off. Homes of this size, they're not occupied fully all the time, so how can the systems really respond to that? Um, and then managing glazing in areas while not minimizing it, um, just making sure that the solar models are informing how we're using energy on all our jobs. And there's a detail uh, later that we'll show you that, that I believe shows this staircase. Um, this was made locally for us. It's patinated brass with a routed out. This was made out of white oak plywood paneling that a local shop fabricated for us. This, this job was not a low budget job, but it, by no stretch of the imagination was it an unlimited budget job. So we had to like find detail and texture where we could. Um, and we talk a lot about detail, texture, materiality in these projects. So you see that sort of pattern making repeated in different areas of the, uh, of the home. Um, the, the scales get a little bit larger from here. This is Uchi that we did quite a few years ago. It was one of the first major projects we, 
we did in Dallas. Uchi and that restaurant group, they were essentially my first client about 18 years ago. Um, we've worked with them continually throughout this time. They've been wonderful. Um, they're, they're essentially friends of the office, and we've been very fortunate to sort of um, keep them, and, and they've helped really us grow and learn uh, over the course of the firm. So this is, this is Texas um, Cypress that we put on the face of the building with an oil finish. And just to give you an idea, here's Maple and the building we're talking about here. This is the building that was there that we had to keep um, because if we tore down, the entitlements would disappear and this restaurant couldn't happen. So this building is actually underneath the building that I'm showing you right now. We stripped the brick off. Um, not everywhere. There's actually some of the bricks still left in the building. We had to keep the slab, the floor, the roof structure. We had to keep the foundation. And we had to respect many of the building lines that were already um, in place here. It was a bank, uh, from what I remember, with the drive through in the back. And it was transformed to this. Um, and, and this was a, a huge thing for an Austin restaurant group to come to Dallas was, a, was, a, was a, an incredible thing for this group and, and for us as well. Um, so they, they really believed in investing in this project um, because they're, they're Texans and they're locals. And th we, we try to bring a rich material palette. This is actually a roofing shingle that we put on the face of the building. We used a, a, another Columba brick project and then a steel sort of screen project upstairs. And our interior design group, which is truly phenomenal, um, works on all of these projects. You can see the sort of idea of embracing imperfection. This, was, this is all walnut that was essentially, um, this is throwaway from a mill. It's, it's material that was sort of thought to be unusable. So it was, the cost on it was extraordinarily low. It was pretty much the shipping cost. Um, so we used the chatter marks from the tooling in the project. These benches were built out of the same material. And it was really embracing the, um, the sort of nature of, of all of the material things and, and trying to build it to a budget. The, some of the little details are trying to run MEP systems through that tiny leg into the floor across to another channel. These are the challenges that we, we really love. To, to make things look effortless and, and easy requires a tremendous amount of work. And hospitality is one industry that um, they're built around that theory, to make an extraordinary experience look effortless. Um, and our offices, you know, we believe that the experience is uh, the thing that sticks with you. Those are the powerful moments. These are the memories that you take, these moments of gathering. And uh, this is what the firm strives to do. Uh, the next project is Uchi that we opened in Miami in COVID, which was uh, really interesting. Those professionals here that actually had to build projects out during COVID over Zoom and phone calls, uh, um, my hat's off to you. That was not an easy thing, especially to sort of maintain quality through that time period was pretty extraordinary. So this project was completely built out. We never saw it once until uh, opening night. Um, this was designed um, by David Tucker in my office. He was really investigating, wrapping, how to make heavy materials look light. Um, the traditions of Japanese gift giving, which have to, have to do with like the highly, the, the sort of um, artistic uh, way you wrap packages and give, give, give a gift to someone. And then we worked with a lighting fabricator designer who made this, all the fixtures in the space and a view of the outside of, of that space. The inside, we talk a lot about creating rooms inside of rooms. What's the sort of hierarchy? What's the procession, choreography of scale and experiences of softness and touch points um, so that every experience is thought of? We try to put ourselves in every chair in a restaurant to make sure that it feels right. This, this slide is a little overblown. It's, it's a, I'm in lighting, it's a little too bright, uh, but lighting is something we work uh, very, uh, a lot on.
and detail shots. Um, you know, these materials are carried through all of their projects. There are moments of change. Um, and this is something, even though we have a lot of repeat, repeat clients, they always ask us to contextualize uh, new projects for them, that they want to have points of difference, that um, it's like you want to be, you want to, you want it to go here and know that it's a familiar place, but have a new experience at the same time. This is another long-term client. Westlake Dermatology, we've been working with for a, a long time. They've been really interesting innovators. They, they still do medical dermatology. Um, and they really wanted to change the medical experience. I think medical is one of these sort of spaces in design that can be, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. Doctor's offices are not what I think of when, when I think of, like, great spaces to, to sort of be in. Like, no one's happy to be there to begin with. Um, so they really wanted to change that. And they invest heavily in design. This is a uh, recent project we, we did for them. And essentially everything you see is custom and was designed for this space. And we're also rebranding their logo and their collateral for this client as well. They've come to be a, to trust us a lot and we really enjoy working with them on all the jobs and now we're, we're diving into how we can create a new brand for them. custom furniture pieces. There's um, a small uh, list of people we love working with that will create these pieces for us. And um, we work hard to try and build them into the budget so that there's room for them. Um, these are the things that typically get cut out in projects. And we want to make sure they stay in because they're the things that are, are some of the most unique uh, moments in, in, the, in the projects. And <clears throat> there's always a screen moment for each one of their, their projects. Um, we're always inspired by different things. I think this team was looking at uh, musical score, trying to figure out how to sort of uh, create the sort of rhythm and the material sort of of these uh, screens. And just a deep investigation of materials textures, um, whether it's perforated, sort of vein marble, upholstery, brass, white oak, terrazzo. This next project takes us back to Austin. This was a hotel that was completed a few years ago in South Congress Avenue. Um, this district was a tricky one. It's a very scruffy, eclectic district. If you've been there lately, it's, it's changing rapidly. Um, but this building is a block long, and it was a big concern that it would have the appearance of sort of just falling out of the sky. And we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So what could we do to make it feel like it's been there for a long time? Um, and a lot of people will still come to us and, and say, we. We did a great job on that mid-century remodel of that office building that was on site. But there was, there was nothing here um, back then. But you can kind of see the paseos that sort of cut into the building. This is the sort of public realm experience, the inviting of the public into these sort of deeper, larger projects that we feel like uh, build sort of generosity and um, creates that sort of sense of goodwill that these, these sort of projects in these highly public areas should have. And then also we started to look at what pocket retail would look like. This is a very small space for a motorcycle shop, another restaurant, um, so that the hotel experience, you only really see from the street right here. That's pretty much it, even though it's essentially the rest of the building. DeHannis was very nice. We worked with him to make a custom mold for this terracotta screen block. Um, <clears throat> that was a screen to the inside of the spaces. We worked with Christy Ten Eyck's firm, 
who did the landscape for the project. They're, they're incredible landscape designers. And this is a stair that exists in the middle of the project. So always sort of bringing people inside of a building and then pushing them back outside. We believe that the rhythm of inside to outside, of blurring all of those sort of lines between architecture, landscape, interiors, indoor, outdoor, shade, sun, um, our meaningful experience. This is the sort of richness that buildings can bring to an experience that should bring. And this is why, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I think of hospitality projects and hotels as uh, sort of a lot of the leaders on how we can go about thinking about the experience um, of a project and, and maybe sometimes putting the product, the building, the architecture sort of a little in the back seat. and the sidewalk, which is so important. Not doing walls, or doing walls completely made out of landscaping. Connecting the street as much as we can, using natural materials. Um, having some tonal shifts, so even though it's white, this is a glazed brick, and then we have a white clay um, uh, masonry above, and then glazed brick down below. And one of these interior courtyards that take you through the sort of a little bit of a maze of retail experiences to a back courtyard that uh, Christie's team screened in with cypress trees. And right behind this tree is a single family neighborhood. So trying to be good neighbors um, so that they didn't have a building uh, just five feet off of their fence, but instead we're looking into a greenscape. There's five restaurant concepts in the project. Um, this is a 12-seat sushi bar called Otoko that's upstairs. It, it's a restaurant gets very little advertising, very people, very few people even know about it. If you're in Austin, you want to go, it's, it's really a wonderful uh, place to have a, a very quiet sort of hidden meal on South Congress. Another restaurant that's close by inside the project, Cafe No Se and Central Standard, which is on the other corner. We completed this a number of years ago. This was the last project um, that was a collaboration between my, the, my old employer, Dick Clark, and our new office. We already split up, um, but we got back together just to, uh, to perform, to finish this uh, project. And a view of the pool, looking out onto Congress Avenue. You can see the courtyard that takes you back down and then empties back out onto the, the sidewalk of Congress Avenue below a landscaping screen. So really trying to do walls and greenery as opposed to masonry sometimes. More Trinity wall systems up here, which we love. And that courtyard that goes above, that comes back down, and brings light into that lobby space because it's a deep lot to bring sunshine in these spaces, but also to uh, give a, a big sense of privacy because South Congress Avenue can be so busy. Springdale General is a 165,000 square foot development in deep East Austin. <clears throat> And the developer, who's a friend of the office, um, saw that the creative community was being gentrified out of Austin, bought this piece of property, and set a goal for a lease rate of 1750 a square foot annual plus triple net, which is, for Austin, it's very, very low. But this is a price point that um, these users could afford. So we really worked backwards from a performance. It was a very interesting process. They were completely open book with us. And at the end of the day, if it didn't hit 1750, we knew the project couldn't be a success because the audience that this was designed for couldn't afford to be here. So it's a very simple series of buildings. Um, and we really tried to minimize the, the cost of being in here. Um, so we actually minimized landscaping because sometimes that can be a large maintenance cost, but we did put trees in. We did water collection for those trees. We put photovoltaics in. 
and the community booked this place up. There's a wait list to get in. And right now, the, it's one third uh, of the users are in a nonprofit hub. There is a, a group in Austin. This is a, it's a nonprofit incubator that takes the entire back half. So that's been a great story. This is where a lot of nonprofits come. They thrive, and then they move on to their sort of new home. And then lots of other users. This is Medici Coffee's roasting facility and training facility. And you can sort of see the simple pre-engineered buildings that we had to use to make sure that we could, we could hit that user. It's exterior grade plywood, perforated corrugated metal, metal decking, and simple buildings. And on any working day, the garage doors open, and you'll see the makers and the nonprofit organizations all sort of working, working in this complex. Uh, Montrose Collective, we delivered last year. It's at the corner of <clears throat> um, essentially Montrose and Westheimer in Houston. Um, which is an incredible neighborhood with a storied past. And this is another project that we were investigating um, mixed-use developments of a certain scale. This is over 200,000 square feet in areas that maybe have not had buildings of this scale before. Um, this was a very high-risk development for our client. Um, and the, the office space that you'll see leased up during COVID, which was phenomenal. We were so happy to hear that. We're happy for them. We're happy for, for us as well. Um, because we were, we were concerned. Um, you know, when people are talking about not going back to the office, there are still users out there trying to anticipate what the future might look like. And what we're being told is they want to be in walkable neighborhoods. They want a true urban connected experience, not only for themselves, the executives who make these decisions, but for the people who work in these offices. Um, so there is a rush to, what we've been told is a rush to quality and connection. Um, so this is the job and this is what we've been working a lot and it's what you saw in the Katy project as well. Where the ground floor level is highly amenitized for retail, for F&B, there's public spaces that cut through this building because it, it can be quite large and hard to walk around. This is Uchi Houston that we did many, many years ago. And that's that small building on that first slide right there. And this is a much larger building here. And you can see that sort of Paseo passageway through the, through the building. Um, a music booking company took the entire office space. And the retail spaces are, are finishing out right now. And they're starting to open up. There's a lot of effort in these types of projects to sort of have the architecture welcome you away from the ground plane. So stairs that are more exploratory, more event sort of driven, that feel like they invite discovery and exploration and curiosity um, so that the second floor level space could be personal services and personal uses and they didn't have to do offices uh, this low into the building. Just a glimpse of it uh, when it delivered not too long ago before the tenant finish out started, started work. And us sort of questioning the glass box office building that we, we know is highly commoditized in cities like Houston. Um, but how can we hit those metric points that brokers provide us and say, you have to have this, you have to have that to get a tenant in a space? Um, how do we start tweaking the rules when it comes to buildings like this, spaces like this, neighborhoods like this, to make sure that we can deliver a project that, that can succeed, but also change expectations in, in many ways? This was a uh, 
Part of this project was a land swap with the city of Houston in order to provide a branch library in, this, in the top of this building right here. Um, so this is a really interesting approach to see public-private partnerships where we're seeing libraries, police stations, civic governmental agencies inside of mixed use and retail developments where honestly they should be. They should be a part of our everyday communities. Um, You'll see some of the sort of attitudes of the office, a mix of materials, exposing exterior circulation wherever we can, integrating landscaping as close to the building as we possibly can, using materials that are going to be low cost and low maintenance, and then creating texture and materiality where the streetscape is really uh, close. Um, <clears throat> and this last project is a tower in Austin, Texas that will break ground probably at the end of the year. It's called the Perennial. Um, we're partnered with a very large firm on this uh, project that, uh, that um, yeah, we've had a wonderful experience working with. Uh, and we're, we're not allowed to talk uh, any more about that. Otherwise, I would absolutely sort of mention the teams we're working with right now. Um, but this is for Cielo development out of Austin. And this building is about 750,000 square feet. And one of the criteria that the owner came to us with was they wanted to build a building to where um, you're no more than perhaps 50 or 60 steps to an outdoor space with greenery. So you'll see the green swath that's running through the building. This facade is a shaped terracotta uh, finish, masonry unit, and then curtain wall between. And you can see the sort of park space uh, mid-building right there. So our scope is really working with the larger team, working on these spaces um, inside and outside, and, and helping them shape the entire building. So I was speaking to someone earlier, it's like, well, what sort of amenities are going into office buildings now, especially post-COVID? How do you get back to the office? What's going to attract people to go back to work? Um, this building is, is very much about health and wellness, everything from the mechanical systems to how you can be close to biophilic design. You can have outdoor space and sort of meaningful collaborative space. So what are the spaces we can build into buildings to get people into the building, but also away from their desk. That the building as a whole starts to behave as an instrument and a vehicle for better work and uh, better, better, better performance. Um, and this is, this is downtown at 4th and Brazos. Austin is a crazy place to be right now. Um, <clears throat> I've lived there a long time, and I, you know, we just, it, as a long time Austinite, it's, it's really quite extraordinary what's happening. A lot of positive things, a lot of things that are, uh, where, you know, Austinite should be cautious about as well. Um, but we do love it when developers want to build buildings that um, really push innovation. And this is the ground level facade that the office designed. Amenitizing it with public and retail space. And the next slide I'll show you is this space right here, the cut through of the building. Again, like many of the other projects that we've showed you, we're trying to give the heart of the building back to the street to bring people into the building. To again, always like break down that class A lobby to where it's not a glass box with Corbusier chairs in the lobby, but something where people actually want to be. We're breaking the ground level plane up. We're bringing you into the building. We have lots of level changes. They create opportunities for smaller spaces off of a busy street that provide intimacy 
collaborative areas, spaces above and below, the sort of three-dimensioning of, of programming instead of it being uh, horizontal, which is the, the normal expectation for a, a tower up like this. And this is that passageway. This is literally 4th Street. You're walking through this to the, to the alley, which will be redeveloped into an active retail space. And then the same owners are developing a hotel on the other side. So it's taking essentially a block and cutting it in half, but not the way it's up, just at the bottom, much like the Katy Terminal Project does. This is a glimpse of that mid-level um, collaborative space. So we, we are having discussions. We have a matrix of public versus private. This is a space that is public to the users of the building, not public to everybody. And I think this is where we find a lot of interest. Is like, where do we start defining those layers of public and private where I can feel like I'm welcome and I can go do work, have meetings, take a phone call, um, collaborate, have an event, enjoy lunch, and still feel like you're a part of the community of the building. And you know, this is up in the sky and on level 23. Go back one. And there's all sorts of amenities on the inside. Um, so conference areas, full of technology, even though this building looks very green and sort of scruffy and we love that, it's uh, fully laden with technology. People can have meetings and do their work almost anywhere in this building. Um, we're designing pickleball courts inside of this project. There's elaborate gym, health and wellness facilities, exercise sort of rooms that are um, sort of at the level that you might expect. Um, see in a in a in a faraway resort as opposed to a, a typical multifamily sort of project, and then the inclusion of water features, and a lot of the sort of biophilic design that that helps sort of soften the overall experience of being in a tower downtown. Um, and this is I'm just, this is the last slide. I know I'm running out of time here, so uh, these are some ongoing projects we're doing. In, in other cities and, and inside the state. Um, but it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Much appreciated. Thank you.